church, even though, Go even ahead. though I um, I could hardly brush my hair or get dressed. So well, this was I, Sunday morning before church. Yes. Right, so go I got to brush through my hair good enough to pull my hair back, made it to church. And um, I was just in so much pain. My husband couldn't hit a bump or anything because it would just, it was like a bone was broken in my body. And um, it was like, well, Deborah prayed for me and it, like the, the pain started to leave. And um, then it came back. And then after the service, I went up and Pastor Ron prayed for me. And again, I thought it was gone. And when I stood up and started to walk, it like came back on me again. And um, that day I just, I just laid around and slept. I, it was excruciating. And um, I had, I had a swell on my collarbone and I couldn't even touch it. It, cause it was too painful to even touch my skin where that was. Mm. And um, I, I spoke with, um, it, I went like that all Sunday. Then I spoke with Pastor Ron on Monday, late morning, mid morning. And um, I told him about the pain. And I said, I think I broke my collarbone. I don't know how I would have done it. And um, a few hours later, my pain totally went away. I, I can lift my arm. I'm scared to. Because no, don't be scared. But, <laughs> but I... I had to walk around with a ball between my elbow and my body because it was so severe. I, I don't know what it was. And it all the pain like left. All the pain left. Amen. It, it just. Now here's what's it was crazy. Impossible. When Lisa came up to the altar, we had a bunch of people at the altar Sunday, and I was praying for them. And when I got over to Lisa, the Lord kept saying, "Pray for healing in her body," and and I kept thinking in myself I was hearing what God was telling me and I was thinking I don't I mean that's going to sound stupid because she's not sick I mean why would I be praying I had no idea that she was hurting at all and uh when we did afterwards she was like I can't believe you prayed that I think I broke my collarbone or something I was like what I mean I had no idea is the swelling gone <clears throat> yes Please? yes the swelling oh. everything all right, well, let's get started. We'll stand right on Appreciate time, it. all right? That was a great testimony. Let's pray, and then we'll get rolling. So, Father God, in Jesus' name, we come to you right now, Lord. We thank you for this meeting this morning, for all the guests, for people that have already been a part of this challenge. We, we bless this work. We bless what has been started. We bless the things that Dawn Reed has done in the past to, to get these things going. Over the years, his faithfulness and the times that he's carried the baton, Lord, we just, we thank you for those years of labor and, and service in your kingdom. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So Listen. now we, we pray for That's Ken Jesus specifically, name. Lord, as, as we reach out. You know, we know there's no distance in the kingdom. So we come boldly before your throne that we would obtain grace and mercy in these times of need. And we pray for Ken and also for even Jerry, Lord, that you would give her strength Amen. through this Church period. Yeah that you would renew Ken's strength. Father, we recognize his healing and we give you all the praise, honor, and glory for that. But now we just speak strength into his body and restoration in Jesus' name. We pray for Lou this morning. God, we thank you for healing him already. We pray for a good result from any tests or any doctors that have anything to do with him. We pray for them. For Pam and Joe and their nephews, we pray for them in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We trust you in every single circumstance, every single situation. We lay before you, God. We prostrate ourselves, and we, we honor you as the King of kings and the Lord of all lords. We worship you with every fiber in our body. We thank you for, for Nan's son, son's father-in-law. We pray for him, Bob. We bring him unto you this morning. And, and pray, Lord, for just, just that you would resolve every single situation, every single circumstance. You, you have the name that is above all names. We pray for Joyce Reed this morning, Lord. We pray for. Uh, and when you, when, when you, uh, when you I look can't at the, believe that. All right. When you, uh, when you look at Edra, Nehemiah, and Esther, you're going to see how important all three of these books are. 
as to the restoration of the temple and how God miraculously used Cyrus. I'm just going by what I when I studying Ezra, and we all know that when, when Cyrus was given the uh, knowledge to go ahead and do the temple, he wasn't even a Christian we know of. But please, uh, these three chapters are very, very important to understand the final destruction of Zerubbabel's temple, which ended up, as you know, Herod's temple, and how many people was involved. Now we're today, we're building the temple of God. So I just want you, when you read these three chapters today, it's our temple we're building today, and the temple is Jesus Christ within us. Okay, go ahead, man, fam. Go ahead, Ron. All right, Pamela, will you go ahead? I can't believe I got knocked off like that. That's just a work of the devil. You want yeah. me to come down and show you how to do it, Ron? <laughs> yeah. Go ahead, Pam. All Pam. right. Go ahead, Pam. We're starting at seven. Okay. I have chapters three through seven of Ezra. Um, I'm going to start with verse 12 in chapter three. But many of the older priests, Levites, and other leaders who had seen the first temple wept aloud when they saw the new temple's foundation. The others were shouting with joy. What a contrast, huh? Some yeah. are weeping and some are shouting with joy. Why the weeping? Uh, the life expectancy of people then was probably 40 to 70 years. The folks who were crying had probably lived through the captivity and had returned to Jerusalem. Maybe they were weeping with joy because the temple was being rebuilt because they could once again obey the law or observe proper sacrifices. Maybe they were weeping because the new temple would never be as great as the original. The Ark of the Covenant was lost. Maybe they were weeping because the stark realization that their nation was needlessly lost due to disobedience or that their temple was lost due to disobedience or that they'd been in captivity for 70 years because of disobedience. Meanwhile, others were shouting for joy. These people had probably been born in exile and had never known the joy of living in the nation of Judah, let alone a unified Israel. They had never seen the temple built to honor and house the God of heaven. Maybe they'd heard the story of the original temple dozens or hundreds of times, because it was in Chronicles, Second Chronicles 5, 13 and 14, it says the trumpeters and musicians joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord, accompanied by trumpets, cymbals and other instruments. The singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, he is good, his love endures forever. Then the temple was filled with the cloud and the priests could perform the service because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the temple of the Lord, of God. So I'm sure that the older people that were in exile were telling their kids about this and how it had been destroyed and whatnot. Amen. Maybe they were envisioning this happening again for joyous. So what does that mean to us as Christians? Is it a warning to us? Because we were all born in captivity, slaves to sin, just as all of Israel emerged from slavery in Egypt during the exit. Those of us who truly believe in Jesus Christ have entered the kingdom of God, just as the nation of Israel. Mm. Sorry, give me a second. No, you go ahead. That's great. Okay. <clears throat> Those of us who God bless you, Pam. What? Said God bless you. Oh, thank you. Sorry. This no, the Holy Spirit's moving. Don't stop it. Never I stop can't, it, Pam. I can't talk though. That's all right. All right. Those of us who truly believe in Jesus Christ have entered the kingdom of God. Just as the nation of Israel entered the promised land and took possession of it. When we were saved, sorry. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Became temples of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And his presence fills our lives. Amen. Just as the presence of God filled the temple. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. Thank you, man. 
How close are you walking with God? He is adamant about total, complete, and entire devotion. He sent his son Jesus to die for our sins, and he sends his Holy Spirit to live in us and help us live a life for Jesus. Amen. Mm. And be still and listen to the Spirit and follow Jesus as close as you can to keep your temple from falling into ruin. Hallelujah. But what if you mess up? What if you do revert back to your old self, your old ways, and you're sinful? Frankly, none of us is perfect, Christian or not. The good news is that later in the book of Ezra in chapter 4, we learn that the neighbors of the Jews, the people who took their place during their exile, don't want the temple to be built. They petitioned the king to stop the work. King Artaxerxes actually halts the work for a while. But in chapter 5, verse 5, but the eye of their God was watching over the elders of the Jews, and they were not stopped until a report was made to Darius. So again, like Don said, Darius is used by God. Amen. And they remind him that King Cyrus of Babylon had returned them to Jerusalem along with the gold and silver and the stolen items from the original temple. Yes. And they were told to rebuild the house of God. Amen. In, chap in chapter six, Darius learns that Cyrus had told them to rebuild, so he gives them the green light to press on. Amen. And then. He even imposes a sentence of death to anyone who tries again to impede them. The temple gets rebuilt. The Jews dedicate it to God. They offer sacrifice. Mm. In chapter 7, verse 6, Ezra comes to Jerusalem from Babylon. He's a teacher well-versed in the law of Moses. The king gave him everything he asked for because the hand of the Lord was on him. God paves the way for Ezra to go to Jerusalem with whomever chooses to join him and sends him a letter, sends him with a letter to Artaxerxes that anyone who gets in Ezra's way will be put to death. He also gives him money and animals to sacrifice. And so Ezra makes it to Jerusalem. So basically the moral of the story is, yes, we may stumble, we may fall, <laughs> but we are the temple. We are God's temple, and he will keep rebuilding us. Hallelujah. You know, any time in our lives, that was beautiful, Pam, but any time in our lives that God gives us such a specific word or a work, I guarantee you that you will feel opposition. And, and I'm telling you, when we started off this morning, and Lisa shared that testimony about her healing, I'm going to see if Mac can splice that on, but my my computer blows up everything happens you feel opposition in these little things that's how you know god is in it yeah. and just like this i'm going to share one verse here why did all these things happen in ezra and nehemiah why was there such opposition regarding building the wall why did they start stop start stop there was so many different times that things stopped that work Artaxerxes come in and he stopped it. Cyrus wanted to start it. There was all this back and forth. If you go to Daniel chapter nine, I'm gonna go to real quick and I'll be gone. But Daniel 9:25, Daniel was one of the greatest prophetic books in the Bible, period. Daniel 9 is probably one of the greatest prophecies in the history of the Bible. Talks about the 70 weeks. But this is what we need to know. This is what our Bible study is about. It's, it's about not reading surface scripture. This is not about just reading through the Bible. This is about knowing the deeper things of the kingdom of God and developing that relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible's just not a book to read. Amen. We want to understand it. And it says this, know therefore, know therefore, and understand it. So we're to know and understand that from the going forth of the command, what command? To restore and rebuild Jerusalem. From that time until, until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And then it goes into giving us the final week that we know that we're approaching is the final seven years on God's timeline. But when you look at that one verse that God gave Daniel, 
when he knew that prophetically, that from that time, from the command of going forth to building the wall till the time of the Messiah, there was so many different things that took place to try to mess that up. And that's what the enemy wants to do in our lives. When we're, wor- when we're walking with God and we're reading our Bibles and we're praying and we're, we're so different than the normal people on the earth today, they don't even know what's happening. But we have that blessed hope within us that we know the Messiah is coming back. Jesus will rule and reign on this earth. He will set up his kingdom on this earth. And we are the generation that he has chosen to do that with. Mr. Reed. I think the people that might be coming in aren't, everybody isn't the same place in the Bible. Well, we're all learning. But to summarize real up and help out what, what Pam has been really saying is true. When you take Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, and especially, I just want to throw this in, Ezra, the Solomon's temple had been destroyed. I'm just talking about people don't know why we have Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. They were went over into Babylon. We all know that. Nebuchadnezzar turned around and destroyed them. Then they were there for a few years, as you know. Then uh, 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 Cyrus from uh, Persia come down and defeated uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, or at, at that time, and uh, the temple stuff was there, available to be carried back by Zerubbabel and all the people there. So we got to remember Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther is the building of the temple, which pertains to us today. And you'll see each one of them chapters really brings out what we should be doing today. Go ahead. Amen. Joe, you're up. Can I make, um, can I make a comment? Yeah, go ahead, Lou. Three minutes. Okay, this is why you are opposed. You are opposed. Any good military leader doesn't tell his soldiers to shoot the people that's already dead. That's foolish. The military leader says, shoot those who are opposing you. Shoot the ones that are alive. Satan opposes those Christians who are truly trusting in Christ and fighting the good fight. Come on. That's good. No wonder I'm getting shot at so much. Right? Amen. That's right, Pam. That's right. Seriously. We all feel that now. We all feel this. We all feel what's going on on the earth today. Yeah. But we're more than overcomers. We're conquerors. That's what God has given us the ability to do. We're not well, walking know, in the spirit of fear. Yes. Could I read one short verse? Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. You know what? This is in Zechariah, Zechariah 4, 6. He says, said, he, so he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Or it says in the Tyndale Living Bible, when the temple was built, they all stood around and said it was built by grace and grace alone. Amen. Amen. Good. I was just saying, when Pam or whoever gets overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit, there'll be many times at 5 o'clock in the morning, people won't understand this unless unless they're into a daily Bible study. Holy Spirit's there. He never sleepeth. The Lord never sleepeth or slumber. But when you all of a sudden you start crying, that's what it's all about. That's the Holy Spirit working through you. And that's so much. We should never quench the Spirit. So it's beautiful, Pam. Go ahead. Go ahead, Lou. No, Joe, you're up. Okay. Um, I'll just start with uh, the book of Ezra and some of the comments out of uh, my Bible's preliminary um, introduction to Ezra. Um, The book of Ezra, whose name likely means the Lord has helped, derives his title from the chief character of chapters 7 through 10. Um, he is, Ezra, Ezra describes himself as a priest, a scribe, and an expert, an expert in the words of the commandments of the Lord. Um, just to summarize again, the, the events of Ezra cover a period of about 80 years. The first significant uh, period is uh, the response of Zerubbabel. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> now these three great men here we're talking about uh, in Ezra and Nehemiah, 
But uh, the book of Ezra, is, of course, particularly circle, cir uh, centers on him, Ezra. But I think of these men, and as I, I was uh, dwelling on each of their activities and how prominent that, that they were. Uh, and to be prominent under uh, the rule of Cyrus, who was a pagan. Uh, so there they are in the midst of his, his uh, administration, if you want to call it, right. his reign. And they are pursuing, just like we were talking earlier, uh, today's Christians, we must stand up. We must uh, fight for and talk about and be who we are amongst the, the pagans of the world. I had a good friend who, who was a, um, oh, was he a, an evangelist? I've never seen one like him. Uh, I, I don't know what happened to him, but he would say, all right, I'm going out and talk to the pagans today. So uh, anyhow, um, but th these three men of God were truly outstanding. And I would even rank them perhaps with some of the kings that we talked about and or above, above many of them. But um, uh, I also want to read uh, just this, although again, uh, we're not talking particularly about Nehemiah, but uh, in the, on page uh, six, page 18 of our books, or if you want to go to Nehemiah 8, verse 9 and 10. And Nehemiah, which is the Tershath, Tershatha. I said, what the heck is the Tershatha? Anyhow, it just underlies that Nehemiah, that word means that he was a like a governor in the um, Persian, Persian government. Uh, anyhow. He, and then it says, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people said unto all the people, this is the day, this is a holy day unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. And we've already, Pam already talked about some of this verse, but. What, tell me again what verse you're in. I know this it's is on page 18 of oh. the book. Do you have a book, Pam? I don't. Okay, it's Nehemiah. Nehemiah. He's Nehemiah. Nehemiah 8, 9 through 10. 8, 9 through 10. Okay, yeah. thank you. It's also, you had mentioned the verse where the people, some wept and some were joyful when they heard the word. And right. I was surprised where it says, uh, go, if you go down into the second chapter, uh, second, cha second paragraph of... Uh, this page 18, it says, it is likely that many of them were hearing God's unadulterated uh, word of word for the first time, as there is no scriptural record of a public reading of God's law since the first wave of exiles had returned from Babylon. Um, so th that was sort of striking to me again because with today the way we have the bible everywhere uh it, it's hard to uh, imagine those times um in the, the next uh phase well just to summarize again um the two major messages that are from ezra are, are god's faithfulness and man's unfaithfulness and again we've seen that through kings chronicles and now again here uh in, in ezra um the uh i i also even though it's not part of my study i have to read cyrus's uh word in chapter um chapter one of Ezra, verse one. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. And again, that's uh, Jeremiah. I'll, I'll pick up that verse later, but Jeremiah had prophesied <clears throat> that this would happen. 
<clears throat> anyhow, by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. Here's this pagan. He's a yep. pagan. He, he does not, apparently, he's either being introduced or I, I don't know what happened. Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. And, and, uh, and it starts off, thus says the king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth, the Lord God of heaven has given me. So he realizes he doesn't, he, he, he doesn't, he's not prideful of his many accomplishments and conquerings. And he has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem. Where, where, what's he's? I don't know how he can uh, even accept this. And right, he he's a pagan been, king. He's yeah, a pagan. What, <laughs> what he must have been thinking. Yeah. And anyhow, who is among all of you? Who who is among you of all his people? May his God be with him and let him go to Jerusalem. And that led uh, led to the uh, again the great leadership of Nehemiah. Uh, for uh, and also, I, I, did, I failed to mention Zerubbabel, uh, who was a, a great man uh, of God, uh, who who led in he, he uh, in the construction of the temple, and brought all of the people that were necessary or all the people who were needed to come with him to construct it. And as we know, there was many oppositions. Uh, the word talks about much of the opposition that the Jews had from peoples uh, all around on their way uh, when they got there and in the uh, process of rebuilding the temple, the, the wall and, and the city, uh, basically. As we know, uh, Pam's already brought out, the temple wasn't as beautiful as as the one that Solomon had constructed, but it was the temple. Um, also, just to go back and um, the, uh, when uh, Ezra finally goes, he goes to uh, instruct the people. And again, he was a priest, uh, a scholar, a uh, scribe, and he instructed the people on the processes of what to do. Um, he even <clears throat> mentions another word that I like, Nathanums. Is that how you say that? The Nathanums were people, they were underlings of the Levites and they were like the grunts. And uh, so anything that had to be done as far as arranging the, uh, the temple and how it was supposed to be administered, uh, Ezra did all of this. Uh, and he used all manner of people, uh, and these Nathanums were, uh, I don't know if they were, uh, they weren't Levites, but they worked under the Levites and would, they would be like, uh, the Levites would be the administrator and the um, Nathanums would be one of the groups of people who would do the, the service work of whatever is needed. Um, so <clears throat> this, <clears throat> The, um, the going on to uh, chapters eight, chapter eight deals um, with the, uh, uh, again, the, the, the building of the temple. It also goes to with the genealogy of all the people who came, came back. And finally, then in uh, in chapter nine, the people confess their sin. They they begin to uh, uh, be repentant. As again, we know the remnant people did many times uh, throughout uh, th these uh, these particular times. Um, the one of the um, one of the the um, uh, things 
that I wanted to bring out is that the you got the, two the, minutes, Joe. They're going to put the hook on you. Okay. Um, the uh, the reading of the law throughout Ezra separated the people of the lands and they clave to their brethren. The, the, the effect of the law changed the people hearing the word. Uh, and again, it gets back to what Don said at the beginning. We are now the temple. And as we take in the word, we are changed. We are led to repent. Uh, go on to chapter uh, to uh, page 21. Um, and uh, it, it talks about <clears throat> the scripture in uh, Galatians 2.20 on page 21 of our book. It says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God, who loved Amen. me and gave himself for me. Amen. So uh, one, one of the uh, key verses is Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is merciful and gracious. He is slow to anger. And he has plenteous, he's plenteous in his mercy. Um, and that's what we continually see throughout uh, Ezra uh, uh, and his, uh, and, and these chapters. All right. That's all I have. Good. Hey, Ron, Ron yes, on the, I want to intercede here that he come back to chapter one, which is I love. When we talk about Cyrus, someone said about a pagan king. Yeah. All right. God used pagan people to build the church today, unsaved. They don't even know it. Now, I just want to say, what did Cyrus do? A pagan king said he gave him money. He told him to pick up all the uh, instruments in the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had taken away. He gave him protection. So here is unsaved people building the church. It's like a man uh, sitting in a hospital donating all his time when he thinks it's going to get him to heaven. He's a pagan and not saved. And then he gets saved and he sees, my God, now, now I see what I'm talking. After he starts reading the Bible and gets born again. Well, there's just an illustration of what God's using today. God will use anything and all things to get his work accomplished. Good. And I like when Joe went back to chapter one. Go ahead. Amen. Listen, what, like I said, we're just not reading our Bibles at a surface level. That's not what this study is about. We want to go into the deeper things of God. So as we take this study, this Bible challenge, and we walk through it in a year, we're going to learn the deeper things of the kingdom of God as we teach you guys the basic principles. If you look at, I want to, I want to brush up on this real quick, because I know a lot of you have your booklets and you're studying deep with us. So in your booklets, go to page 12, where Joe just talked about. And I want to clarify this in the book. The main thing that I get out of this, out of these two pages where Joe shared out of, it says in, in that second paragraph on page 12, it says, Ezra had prayed. Prayer is the most powerful tool available to a child of God. Prayer is the most powerful tool available to a child of God. Whether it is uttered in praise or despair, for ourselves or for the need of others. That's why when we was praying this morning and that anointing hit, it blew the computer out. Prayer is one thing that ensures our connection to him that remains open and viable. Now go to the top of page 13. At the page of top of 13, it says this. We should never underestimate the power that our prayers words and actions can have on others christ calls us to share our testimony with others that they may see him in us and be drawn into a state of repentance the testimony that is placed in our hearts by the holy spirit will help others to overcome sin in their lives 
People say testimony isn't in the Bible. I say testimony is the entire Bible. And that's why we always talk about Re Revelation 12, 11. It says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives even as unto death. This uh, is what we want to develop in one another. This attitude to live on the earth as dead man walking, where we've given up our lives for Christ. And others can see that Christ in us, and that is our testimony that draws them to Jesus. Amen. Uh, Amen. I have two things, Ron. One is... Very quick, as we long as ready. No, just, just one thing, Ron. Uh, life, th there's two things. Uh, when you were talking about we should never under underestimate the power of our prayers. The word says, and I, I don't know what the verse, chapter and verse is, but life and death are in the power of the tongue. Yeah, it's in Deuteronomy um, 8. And um, I'll forget what my other point was. Go ahead. That's all right. Don't worry. You could come back. Rhonda, are you ready? Yes. Okay. It's yes. all yours, buddy. Okay. Nehemiah chapters 1 through 6. The words of Nehemiah, I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left in the captivity. They said unto me, the remnants that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. I heard these words and I sat down and I wept. And I mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keeps covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let your ears now be attentive to your eyes be open that you may hear my prayer of your servant, which I pray now before you day and night for the children of Israel. We have sinned against you both I and my father's house. I beseech you the word that I command your servant Moses saying, if you transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, I gather you and bring you unto the place that I've chosen to set my name. O oh Lord, I beseech you, let now your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and prosper. I pray, grant mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer, that's Nehemiah. The king said to me, why is your countenance sad, seeing you're not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of your heart. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my fathers, lies waste and the gates are consumed with fire? I prayed to the God of heaven. The king said, well, what do you make of your request? I said unto the king, if it pleases the king, if your servant has found favor in your sight, you would send me unto Judah, unto the city of my fathers, that I may build it. The king said unto me, for how long should your journey be and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me. I said, the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. But here's the opposition. Sanballat and Tobiah heard of it and it grieved them exceedingly. There was a man to come to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem for three days and I rose in the night. And a few men with me, I went out by night and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down and the gates that were consumed with fires. The ruler knew not where I went. You see the distress that we are in and that Jerusalem lies waste. Then I said at the hand of my God, which was good upon me, that they had spoken unto me, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But here's the opposition. But when Sam Ballot and Tobiah heard it, they laughed us to scorn, despised mm. us. I answered them and I said unto them, the God of heaven will prosper us. We and his servants will arise and build. 
chapter 3. The sheep and the fish gate were rebuilt. The bolts, the doors, the bars, they restored Jerusalem. The valley and the fountain gate will, was repaired. The repairs were made by fellow Levites above the horse gate, and the priests made repairs. Chapter 4, Sam Ballad heard that they were rebuilding the wall, and he became angry. He ridiculed the Jews. Can they bring back the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah was next to him, and he said, what are they building? Even a fox climbing on it would break down their walls of stone. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their hearts. The people of Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out. And so there's much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. The Jews lived near, came, told us 10 times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. Fight for your families, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. When the enemies heard this, they plotted and that God had frustrated it. We all returned to the wall, each to our own work. From that day on, half of the men did the work while the other half were equipped with spears, bows, and armor. Those who carried materials did the work with one hand and held a weapon in the other hand. The man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Whenever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us. Our God will fight for us. And then chapter five, Nehemiah helps the poor. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. We are sons, daughters, are numerous. In order Amen. for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our home to get grain <coughs> during this famine. Still others had to borrow money for the king's tax on the fields and the vineyards. There was a great outcry for the charges. You are charging people interest. What are you doing? It is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God? Let us stop charging interest. Out of the reverence for God, I devoted myself to the work on the wall. Remember me, God, for I have done for these people. There was further opposition when the word came to San Ballot, Tobiah, and even Geshem that I had rebuilt the wall. Sam Ballot and Geshem were scheming to harm me. I prayed, now strengthen my hands. Remember Tobiah and Sabalat, my God, because of what they have done. And the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed. When all our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid because they realized, realized that this work had been done with the help of God. Amen. You know, can I say this to uh, Rhonda? Mm. Rhonda? Yeah. This is yeah. amazing. Go ahead, how, how you brought that up. But I just want to throw this in. Those are just joining in or wherever they're at in the Lord's work. Uh, we've got a new king now. And I don't know whether I can pronounce this right or not, but our tax, yes, or whatever, okay? Artaxerxes. Yes. Now, can you imagine... We know, we know what happened on Darius. Everybody knows about that, right? Here's another pagan king, all right? And uh, here comes uh, well, what ne Nehemiah has a long face. Uh, we call it discernment. There's something wrong with that man or woman. Here's a pagan to say, what's wrong? You don't, you're not the excitable person you always were. Then he gives him permission you know, to go back and rebuild the walls. As we know, it took 52 days and why during this time, sometime uh, back in Darius there, they, some of the people wanted to help build the, uh, the uh, te temple and they were not allowed because they were left there after the destruction of the temple. They were left there, but they were so paganism away, even though they, some of them were Jewish, that today God is using everybody to build the Christ, the body of Christ, and that's what we're doing right now. That's very important to realize how you're moving up in time with new king, go go ahead. You know the, the main thing. Go ahead, Lou. I just want to say, Rhonda, when you read this, you brought me to tears. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. 
I heard these words, and I sat down and wept. The Lord just brought me to weeping when you read this, because this is the city of the great king. The great king's not David. The great king is Melchizedek, the king of righteousness and the prince of peace. He built this city. Praise God. Thank everything you. in this book, everything that we're reading is revolving around rebuilding this wall and rebuilding Jerusalem. Why? You guys got to see this. Because the prophecy was given on Daniel 70 weeks, Daniel 9.25, know therefore and understand it, that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, from the time that commandment was given, you can, you can actually count. I have mapped it out to the day. From the day, the specific day that that commandment was given until the Messiah was cut off, crucified. You can map out every single day and know when the Messiah was going to be crucified. This is why there are so many stops and starts. Each one of you have talked about this. There has been great opposition. Why? We have to understand why we have to get through the opposition. Then it helps us have the ability to walk through it. So when we're confronted with all these different issues and circumstances in our lives, we can see why Cyrus was told to build the wall. God chose him. Sure, he was a pagan king. Sure, he did what he was supposed to do. But then when Artaxerxes come in, he said, wait a second. Who does Cyrus think he is? You tell them to stop building the wall. I'm going to give the command to build the wall. So then they stopped and started there and stopped and started there. And it was just a continuation of these starts and stops. So what did that do? That caused the people who were trying to figure out when the Messiah was coming, they couldn't figure out the day or the date. Why? Because there was so many starts and stops. The only way you could have ever figured that out is to be from our side of this looking backwards because now we know that the messiah was crucified in 31 a.d we know when that happened on the passover which was meets on 14 and we could count back and then when that coincides with one of those dates we know which one was the one that triggered the rebuilding of the wall in jerusalem now here's what's important this is what i'm going to talk about tonight on the youtube channel 7 p.m Tune into his true seeker. I'm going to show you how all this too ties in together. But now, why is this important to us now? Because we know now that Israel became a nation in 1948. We know that. Jesus said this generation will not pass. A generation is 70 years plus 10. That's it. So it takes us to 2017, 18 to 2028. That's the window we're looking at. And that's when, why all these things are happening today. So if you have your booklets, we're going back to our booklets. I'm reading from page 18. 18 and 19 is my portion today. I want to start off right there at the first paragraph where it says, The people of Jerusalem had much to celebrate under the leadership of Zerubbabel. Ezra and Nehemiah, God's people had been granted the privilege of restoring the altar, the temple, and finally the walls and gates surrounding the city of Jerusalem. Now listen to this very closely. The process of rebuilding had been a slow one. It was marked by many, by many stops and starts. Why? It's just because I'm telling you, Satan was trying to prevent the work of the Lord and cause confusion with all these different starts and stops because he knew that the prophecy was given by Daniel, that from the beginning of that, from the command to build the wall, well, nobody knew there was going to be 10 commands to rebuild the wall or seven or however many there were, so they never knew when to start and stop the counting. But now over a hundred years after the first exile had returned, the city of David once again provided physical security and protection for her citizens. The last paragraph on page 18 says, the revival that followed was glorious. 
Without hesitation, God's people open their hearts and minds to receive his word. That's what every opposition in your life is about. It is there to keep you out of the word of God. Why do you think we're seeing one of the greatest falling aways in the history of the church? Why do you think people aren't reading their Bibles? Why do you think people aren't tithing? Why do you think people aren't going to church? They're just slowly drifting away. It is like many of them were hearing God's unadulterated word for the very first time, as there is no scriptural record of a public reading of God's law since the first wave of the exile had returned from Babylon. So now all of a sudden the power of the word of God was being breathed out into the atmosphere and that was changing people's lives, the reading of the word. So they read the book and the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. It says there, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. First John 1, 9. Amen. Amen. It is hard to look back over a life that is filled with regrets. The sins of our past loom large in our minds, and oftentimes the memories of these sins cause us to doubt our current worth. Yet once a sin is confessed, listen, once a sin is confessed, that does not say you have to confess every single sin. If you do that, you're forgiven. But this verse is written for those that have committed these sins that haunt them, and they never get away from the sin. And you can go back to the word of God and say, look, 1 John 1, 9 tells me, if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. There is nothing, amen, amen, Rhonda, there is nothing that can stop us from that grace and that forgiveness once we confess that sin. Nothing. Once a sin is confessed, God forgives us and cleanses us from all our unrighteousness. He has wiped the slate clean and expects us to do the same. Instead of wallowing in the needless guilt, how many of us get caught in that battle of something we might have did? I mean, 10 years ago, and, and the enemy keeps bringing that up and bringing that up and bringing that up, where the Bible tells us, look, if we confess our sins, we're forgiven. And then if we bring it back up to God, God don't even know what we're talking about because he has the ability to forget. So once he forgives us, he forgets it. Then when you come back and go, God, you know, I did this 10, 15 years ago or whatever, God goes, I don't even know what you're talking about. I didn't even think that was you. Why are you bringing that up? Because he has the ability to do that. He expects us to do the same instead of wallowing in needless guilt. God asked that we join him in the celebration of our return home. Now, listen to this. Holding on to a sin that God has forgiven is the claim that his decision has not closed the matter. Even beyond regret, this is a very prideful stance to take. When we come before the, the throne of God and we rely upon his grace and mercy, there is no greater place to be in the kingdom of God than to be able to humble ourselves before him and to know that the creator of this universe loves us, sent his son to die for us, and that we could have everlasting life the forgiveness of our sins, no matter what we've done. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It's beautiful. It's true love. It's the ultimate act of love. Sometimes Amen. people... Amen, Ron. Many, many you know, people are... that First John 1, 9 will never, ever be canceled. It is always true, always was true, and always will be true. Amen. Listen, before we close out, I'm going to give, I think Pastor Don has something to say there. I want to play our commercial. And uh, before we get, before we close, so I'm going to share the screen here. So please stay with us. Listen to the commercial. And uh, I love every single one of you. Pat is committed to show God's life-changing love through the power of testimony. Our new yearly initiative program is the perfect way to come alongside the gospel of Jesus as it is being preached. For $77 a year, you can become a Bible partner with Crossing Paths. 
With your $77 donation, you will receive the monthly Through the Bible in a Year publication. This publication will help guide you in reading the Bible completely within a year. You will also receive the Crossing Paths monthly newsletter, where you will find the latest news about our ministry. Today, because of our fast-paced lives, it can be hard to make time to read the Bible. Crossing Paths would like to change that. That's why we've started a Zoom Bible study on Wednesdays at 11 o'clock a.m. Simply go to crossingpaths.org and click on the Bible Partner button and follow the instructions to become a part of the Zoom meeting. You'll have the opportunity to talk with Crossing Paths staff as you study the Bible. Join with Crossing Paths today to spread the gospel of Jesus through the power of testimony. Hey, Ron. Yes. Ron, about uh, 10 minutes ago, the volume is... I have my volume all the way up, and I'm having trouble hearing. Yeah, my volume was good. Was yours good, Pam? Yeah, I could hear it, everything. Yeah, so, some sometimes they just vary that way. That's okay. Okay. Mr. Reed, did you have something to close with? No, I just wanted to summarize up that everything was very clear today, and especially maybe some new ones that come in. And uh, but, uh, Joe there, I just want to let Joe know that a miracle that Ron and I and Mark went golfing in Newcastle the other day, went up and sat down and started talking. And of course, I started witnessing to the owner. And he said, I'm born again. And he would he picked up the whole tab for the whole golf for all three of us for 18 holes. Wow. And I said, that was amazing. And so, Joe, we're in a, a golf outing to promote Crossing Pass on Monday at Fellowship of Christian Ethics. And Joe, if you'd like to be our fourth one, uh, we'll carry you, even though you don't uh, golf as good as I do. But uh, if you'd oh, like to go, just give me a call later on, Joe. We'd love to have you. Just come up here and we'll work it out. Go ahead. That's all I want to say. All right. Mary Jane, it is so good to see you on the call. Thanks, I know you have your no, phone don't. muted, but it's so good to see you on the call. I'm glad you got your Bible, your Pathways booklet yesterday. That made my day. Is she muted? She's muted yeah. right now. She muted herself. Uh, oh, okay. if, you know, if anyone wants, even if they don't have the booklet, you can uh, fax or take a photo of that uh, reading schedule for the whole month and just send it to people. That's what I had to do for um, for Ken. He didn't yes. get a book. Well, like I said, we're keeping Ken in prayer. We prayed for him at the beginning. We'll splice that back in if that's cut off. I don't know for sure or not, but. I know the spirit of God was in this Bible study today, and, and that's our number one concern. Look, Mary Jane said on the bottom, from Mary Jane to everyone, thank you, Pastor Ron and Dawn. Yeah, she's down in Florida. I'm jealous of her. Yeah, she's in the she's down there bathing in the sunshine. <laughs> but listen, we're going to close out for today. I love you guys. Thank you once again. Tune in tonight at 7 p.m. We'll be on YouTube live. I'll send out a link. Uh, you can check me out under his true seeker. So I'll see all you guys tonight. If not, look for this. Hey, Landon. Look for our video that we'll be posting as soon as possible. All right. Love you guys. I'll see you next time. Bye. Okay, Ron, God bless. God bless. God bless. See you, Bye. See you Don. Bye. See you, Lou. Bye, buddy. Call me, Joe. Bye, Pamela. Bye, Ron. All right, where's Bye, my Ron? Mate?